Okay. So as far as I remember, this is what we have finished with last time, isn't it? I think so. Yeah, we talked about labor. Um, so we're going to continue our conversation about um, digestive activities this week. I do hope to finish in a reasonable pace, at the reasonable pace, finish to talk about the digestive activities in the alimentary tract per se. So we can move on and talk about metabolic aspects of nutrition a little bit, which is, I hope, going to be fun. Um, so we figured out <clears throat> the main digestive roles of liver, and we're going to come back to it later uh, when we will talk about absorption and processing of nutrients. But so far, in terms of the intestinal digestion, liver produces bile, right? Now, gallbladder, the organ located inferior to the right lobe of the liver, <clears throat> its function is to store bile. As I mentioned before, when, when bile salts are released in the intestines, at some point they are reabsorbed in the intestine and they enter portal veins that deliver bile salts from intestine back to the liver. That will increase bile production. So as we, as we eat, as the nutrients are being present, being digested in the intestines, bile production increases and increases and increases and it will subside only when all chem leaves duodenum. Obviously this process of bile production will result in a pretty considerable amount of excessive bile, which could be useful when we have next meal, <clears throat> because then we don't have to wait for the liver to ramp up the production. We already have some bile stored in a gallbladder. So that's its function. It also concentrates bile. When bile enters gallbladder. It stays there. Water is absorbed. Bile salts stay in the, in the liquid. Okay. So the very next fatty chem will produce CCK, which will stimulate contractions of the gallbladder, which will release the bile in response. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay. So obviously, if, if somebody is losing the, the gallbladder, then what's going to happen in terms of digestive activities? Huh? Well, bile will be produced, but think about this. If, huh? It's going to take longer, and imagine if somebody consumes fatty food, okay? That fat will take longer to be digested. So these people will have less tolerance to the fatty food. They will have to watch the diet, and they still, they still function, okay? No, it has to be stimulated. So, bile, so, so here's the deal. Think about this. That's actually, you brought a great point. So imagine you have an empty duodenum. Empty. Nothing is, well, hypothetically, nothing is in there. So there's no bile produced because there is, there is no chem and nothing stimulates CCK and secretin. Right? Now, chem enters duodenum. Distension and presence of, well, not distension, yeah, to a little bit, but Presence of fat in the intestine stimulates CCK, right? CCK, in terms of the liver and gallbladder stimulation, it will stimulate the, uh, the, the contraction of gallbladder. So the bile is released in the intestine. Now remember, it's a storage. Gallbladder doesn't make anything, right? It's a storage. But bile in the intestine, meaning bile salts are in the intestine, meaning at some point, those bile salts will be absorbed in the intestine, into the blood, will get to the liver and stimulate more bile salts. Does that make sense? 
those more bile salts will break down fat and will be absorbed and will stimulate more bile salts and that's your positive feedback. Somebody doesn't have gallbladder. Fatty chem will still stimulate CCK. No worries. But <clears throat> there is no organ to release the bile. So CCK will work on the pancreas mostly. Secretine that is produced in response to the chem will stimulate liver to produce bile. But in a healthy person, the person with gallbladder, will be mostly bile salts and a little bit of secretine. And the person without gallbladder, secretine is the only thing that will stimulate bile production and it'll take longer. If that makes sense. They will still have bile. Don't, don't worry, but it, it'll take much longer. Does that make sense? Now, um, it doesn't have the submucosal layer, only three mucosa, muscularis and serosa. Now, what I want you to know, like up front, the anatomy of the ducts. Okay? So this flow chart on the left shows you the anatomy of the ducts. Liver. Two ducts. Right hepatic and left hepatic. Two hepatic ducts merge into the common hepatic duct. Common hepatic duct merges with the cystic duct. Remember, cystic refers to the gallbladder. Cystic duct and common hepatic duct form the common bile duct. Sometimes it is referred to as just bile duct. Okay? So common bile duct is the, the major tube that carries the bile. That's the end point. Does that make sense? Common bile duct merges with the pancreatic duct. They merge right here in so-called hepatopancreatic ampulla. And bile and pancreatic juice are released from the same orifice. Okay? Does that make sense? This pathway, you got to know that. I mean, it's basic anatomy, but you should know. Okay? If I ask you what merges with what, you should be able to answer. Does that make sense? Good? Um, Gallbladder, since it's not really an essential organ, not much going on there except for the bile concentration. And that's where gallstones come from. Gallstones are formed in people mostly with hypercholesterolemia. Well, not mostly, but it's a risk factor. Okay? Does that make sense? Because the big chunk of the gallstone is usually cholesterol, solid fatty substance. Elevated calcium levels in the blood, which is honestly rare. Okay? So hypercalcemia <coughs> is rare. Um, mostly, if you think about it, food that is extremely rich in fats. Eh, we'll talk about it. I, the whole high-fat diet, low-fat diet, we'll talk about it. Um, lack of activity and obesity. Well, obesity, the reason, uh, people who are obese usually have hypercholesterolemia, high blood cholesterol, just as a complication. You know, uh, Lack of mobility, if... No movement, okay? No mechanical stimulation of the gallbladder, not just shaking. So, <clears throat> generally, it's the whole idea of probably this AP1 and AP2 courses that we teach here is that you should eat properly and move around a lot. <laughs> it's kind of a take home message from every system that we talk about. Just eat properly and move around a lot. 
Um, they're usually not large. So this shows you <clears throat> the, the, the gallbladder with multiple gallstones. Um, the mechanism of cholecystitis, which is inflammation of the gallbladder, the stone blocks the cystic duct. Bile doesn't, isn't relieved, gallbladder stretches, becomes inflamed, it hurts. Cholecystitis manifests the very, very acute pain in the right hypochondriac region. Now it is treated fast. I mean, I still remember, uh, I leave on Friday, I was working in Louisiana, I leave on Friday night, and you know, I have colleagues that sit in the same office room with me, and then I come back on Monday, and there's the same guy, you know, Japanese dude that sits in the corner, and another colleague of mine walks in and says, so how are you feeling? I say, well, what happened? Oh, he had cholecystitis over the weekend, they removed his gallbladder. He's back to work. Like, it's really quick, you know. Um, yeah, the treatment is surgical removal. Probably because they soft, so it's really hard to break. And it's probably not worth it. Because if it gets lodged in the duct downstream, I mean, it's, it's all pain in the butt. Just remove it. Um, so, after the removal, bile is still produced by the liver. Not concentrated anymore. What is the largest gallstone that was ever removed? Any idea? Give me like a, a ballpark number. I enjoy this conversation every time. Because people just have no idea. In pounds. Yeah, just, just, just guess. Just guess. And I probably just, you know, I gave out some of the answers. Okay, keep guessing. It's more. Okay, I'm not going to tease you anymore. 14 pounds. The largest gallstone ever removed. Uh, it's in Guinness World Record book. It was British lady. My only question is, why did you wait for so long? <laughs> What's the reason? So, and, and obviously they had to remove the gallbladder as well. But she survived. So, yeah. She's like... 60 something at the time was removed but it's a lot of patience <laughs> a lot of patience to wait yeah 14 pounds it's efficient you can find it it's they refer to weight in in kilograms at 6.29 which is almost 14 maybe without like couple of ounces okay now pancreas um, let, let's put it this way. So if among, you know, the digestive organs, if you remove, can you live without a stomach? Yes, you can. It's not going to be as, as good life as you, as you have now, but, uh, there are surgeries that require the removal. Um, they can actually put something like a little artificial bag. Or leave just maybe a little fragment of it. So yeah, you can live practically without a stomach. Can you live without duodenum? Hardly, pro probably no, no, no. You can live without large intestine. It can be removed pretty much entirely. Um, we discussed the importance of the liver. It is really important, not only for digestion. Okay. Now pancreas for digestion is probably equally important and I'm not touching on its role in the endocrine regulation of blood sugar but as the digestive organ although it's secondary it's not a part of alimentary tract it is crucial anatomically pancreas is located eh, pretty much inferior to the stomach okay you can see it right here you can see it's a it's a head the pancreas, tail of the pan pancreas, and the body in between. It is really, really pink because of a lot of blood vessels. A lot of blood vessels. And uh, the exocrine part of the pancreas, remember there's an endocrine part, right? The, the, the Langerhans islets, 
That's exocrine part because it produces the secretions that don't go in the blood. So exocrine part is essentially consists of asini, that's a single sinus, okay? Sort of a, a it's a, essentially a little secretory gland which empties into the ducts. And ducts collect the secretions into the main pancreatic duct, which you can see here. Okay. Now, this acinar cells produce two main components of the secretion. One component is bicarbonate, base. And another big component are enzymes. Okay? Does that make sense? I mean, anatomically, if I show you the picture of the pancreas, just recognize that it's a pancreas. And if I tell you that, you know, what produces exocrine secretions, don't convince me that it's Langerhans Islands. It's asana. Okay? Clear? Fun part, secretion. Now, remember we talked parietal cells in the stomach. Remember. What do they make in the stomach, parietal cells? Acid, hydrochloric acid. Now, acinar cells make bicarbonate, among others. It turns out, I mentioned it before, and I'm going to tell you this again. The mechanism, chemical mechanism for bicarbonate formation, for hydrochloric acid formation, it is common in all different organs and systems. Look at this. This is the acinar cell, and this is the blood. Okay, first of all, blood has a lot of CO2. We good? A lot of CO2. CO2 diffuses into the cell, into the acinar cell. When it diffuses, CO2 in the cell combines with water and produces carbonic acid. Does that make sense? So far, the same step that you can see in parietal cell. Carbonic acid dissociates to the proton and bicarbonate. Does that make sense? Now, in the stomach, what do we need for digestion? Acid, which means hydrogen ion, which means proton, right? In the pancreas, we need bicarbonate, right? Bicarbonate, by the means of secondary active transport, is transported into the lumen of the pancreatic duct. Does that make sense? Where does it go next from the pancreatic duct eventually? Duodenum, right? Make sense? That's it. That's it. That's all you need to know about bicarbonate. What about hydrogen? Hydrogen is transported into the blood. Again, secondary active transport. And here you have um, pretty much you have an acidic tide here, which means in the pancreas, blood becomes acidified because of the influx of these hydrogen ions. That makes sense. Now, one thing that I really want to show you here, it's pretty, I think it's pretty neat. It's what drives these processes, especially the removal of hydrogen ion. So, here you can see that this, this green circle, okay, green sphere, shows sodium getting into the cell and hydrogen going out of the cell. Concentration of sodium is higher where? Outside of the cell. So sodium will do what? The process called diffusion. Diffusion, that's important, diffusion. So in diffusion, Diffusion, does it require any energy? No. 
Okay, so that's your sword. Imagine that those are like actual little balls, okay, sodium ball. And here at the bottom, you have hydrogen ball. So when the sodium ball goes all the way down, it gains speed, right? It will hit the hydrogen ball. What will happen to the hydrogen ball? Go up, right? Now, this, this is absolutely, the analogy is not using the proper terms. But the idea is, when sodium diffuses across the membrane, the kinetic energy of that diffusion, just energy of movement, just movement of ions, can be used to pump hydrogen against the concentration gradient, sort of, quote-unquote, uphill. Do I make sense? This is called secondary active transport. <clears throat> Let me ask you this. Why we still is there any ATP involved right here? No. Why we call it an active transport? Yeah, for hydrogen it does require energy. Now you can say, wait a minute, there is a law in the nature, the energy conservation. Does that make sense? Because I mean, if you just take it, this is awesome. This is perpetuum mobile. That's the, the perpetual engine right there. Just sodium goes in and the hydrogen pumps out. We can, we can do something about it. Why it's not a perpetual engine? In regards to sodium, if you just let sodium diffuse into the cell, what's going to happen to the sodium concentrations outside and inside eventually? They will become equal, right? So you have to have something that maintains that difference. Do I make sense? What maintains the proper concentrations of sodium and potassium across the membrane? Sodium potassium pump. That, does it make sense? Here it is. Sodium potassium pump. Up there with ATP. It requires ATP. This is what the energy is used for to maintain the concentrations across the membrane so sodium can, in some other place, flow in. It's like a water mill, you know? You pump water up right here so it can go down right there and, I don't know, move, move a wheel or something. Does that make sense? In my opinion, my experience, not only opinion, this is the cornerstone concept that sodium potassium pump will create sodium and potassium gradients and these gradients will enable the transport of so many things across the membrane we soon are going to introduce the absorption in the small intestine the mechanisms for absorption you will see the sodium potassium pump again we move to renal, the whole movement of ions in the, the reabsorption in renal tubules, it's all about sodium potassium pump. It creates those gradients, and these gradients enable secondary active transport. Do I make sense? Really, just, just keep in mind, I, I always, you know, physiology is really simple when you identify the core concepts. So that's one of them. Does that make sense? Um, so, if you like put this next to parietal cell generation of hydrogen ions, you will see that the basic difference is where hydrogen and bicarbonate go. Here, hydrogen goes in the blood, bicarbonate goes into the lumen. In parietal cell, it's exactly the opposite. Does that make sense? questions about this. Here comes the tough part. Seriously, I'm not trying to scare you. <clears throat> Pancreatic enzymes. Up front, what you have to know and give you the description of the function, you pick the right answer. I give you the name, you pick the right description. So for each enzyme, you have to know the substrate, 
and we have to know the product, essentially the function. Is that clear? The good news, it's not a list. You, you don't have to write down the list. I'm not going to ask you the question like, and as the last question, please, all pancreatic enzymes with their function, and if you miss one, you bone. Okay? It's all multiple choice. So, when you talk about enzymes, when we talk about enzymes, you should always remember which substrates you're going to find in the... Oh, by the way, these enzymes, where do they go? Duodenum, yeah, duodenum. Lumen of duodenum, right? So they're going to break down food. Are we clear about it? What are the major nutritional components of food? Carbohydrates, uh, uh, proteins, amino acids. We'll get, this help us to get to amino acid proteins and hmm? fats. So this three. Okay, these are main nutritional components that we need to break down. So we're basically going to group these guys into the function related to those nutritional components. And we also have DNA, DNA, RNA, okay? They don't have really um, a lot of nutritional value, okay? But they're still present, okay? So, enzymes, first. peptidases or proteases, enzymes that break down proteins. This floor. Trypsin. Trypsin is produced in the form of trypsinogen. Actually, if you will, if you will look at this four, okay, trypsinogen, chemotrypsinogen, proelastase, procarboxypeptidase. What do you think the, the suffix gen or the prefix pro, what do they mean? Hmm? So, okay, we have trypsin, but it is preceded actually by trypsinogen. We have elastase, but it's preceded by proelastase. Precursors. Does that make sense? So they aren't produced functional. They are produced, uh, they need to be activated, all of them. Does that make sense? So what is activated, what activates trypsin? The enzyme called enterokinase. Does anyone remember? Where is enterokinase in the intestine? In the microvilli. It's in the brush border. It's one of the brush border enzymes. So think about this. Trypsinogen jumps into the duodenum, swims to the microvilli, and gets activated. When enterokinase activates trypsinogen, it becomes Trypsin. Does that make sense? Now, trypsin will activate chemotrypsin from chemotrypsinogen, elastase from proelastase, and carboxypeptidase from procarboxypeptidase. Do that make sense? It's like an initiation, right? Trypsin has to be initiated first and then it initiates everybody else, like vampires. Does that make sense? Is that clear? Because I'm going to ask you. And you have to understand that when, when I mean functional enzyme, it's trypsin, not trypsinogen. Or elastase, not proelastase. Proelastase is not a functional enzyme. It has to be activated by trypsin. Are we clear? Now, all of them, all of these enzymes, break down peptide bonds. So they break down proteins or polypeptides into the smaller chunks. That makes sense. 
in which other organ proteins are digested? So intestine, they're digested in the intestine, obviously, in the duodenum, and where else? Stone. Kind of going back to work it in your brain. Fat. Two enzymes. So lipase and lipase. Lipase breaks down triglycerides, specifically triglycerides. Phospholipase breaks down phospholipids. Okay. Now lipase is produced ready to go. Every all these are produced ready to go, while phospholipase is to be activated. So I want you to know the activation mechanism. If I ask you what activates proelastase, you tell me trypsin activates proelastase. If I ask you what activates trypsin from trypsinogen, you tell me, well, enterokinase does it. Does that make sense? Amylase breaks down carbohydrates. We already have amylase in the saliva. That's another place, right? So carbohydrates are broken down in the mouth by salivary amylase and in the duodenum. Does that make sense? Cholesterol esterase. <clears throat> the thing is, cholesterol is often bound to other molecule. Cholesterol esterase breaks cholesterol free from that other molecule, usually protein. Cholesterol is really important. I'm just, I'm so anxious to get to the metabolism and nutrition. It's going to be fun. Okay. Um, and then ribonucleases and deoxyribonucleases, they break long DNA chains into the individual nucleotides. Does that make sense? Do I understand? Good? So you have chain of nucleotides, say you eat DNA. Okay. So DNA is broken down in individual nucleotides by deoxyribonuclease. And then each nucleotide is broken down by enzymes of the brush border, like phosphatase and nuclease, nucleosidase into the sugars and bases and phosphate residues. This is a, a good time to kind of cheer you up. And do a little digression. You all heard about GMO, right? Genetically modified organisms. Now, they're good, really. Let me explain why. Everything that you eat, everything, like every fruit that you, unless you go foraging in the wild forest, everything that you eat is genetically modified. Seriously. If you would compare the actual, the, the corn, the wild corn, and the domesticated corn, you won't be able to eat wild corn. It's not edible. Okay? And that's practically true for, for many, many fruits and vegetables. I'm not even talking about animals. All our dogs are genetically modified. The only thing, you know, for the entire history of humanity, the genetic modification was a bit um, haphazard, accidental, you know. Um, you try to do something, you select, of course, but you have no control over the underlying mechanisms. Does that make sense? Because really, all selection leads to the changes in the genome compared to the original ones. Now, now we have a control. We can take... Um, we can take a protein that confers the resistance to, say, insecticide. Okay, and we can put it in the crops, and we can grow crops, and then we can spray them with insecticide, and it will kill bugs without affecting crops. 
and there's actually an organic insecticide called Bt, which does exactly this. Okay, so you can do it. Now, um, one of the concerns is, oh, we insert some gene into that potato, and that gene will incorporate itself in the human genome and will make us, I don't know, potatoes or some other horrible thing will happen. Okay? So here's the deal. You see what happens to DNA in your intestine? It is completely destroyed. Every day you eat enormous amount of DNA by any standards with your food. You eat like raw vegetables, raw fruits, a bunch of it, DNA, you inhale it. You have a whole bunch of bacteria with like real DNA and not very much of it ends up in your genome really. So it's definitely not a concern. Last concern that people have often about GMO is, um, oh, what if those new traits, what if these modified products will be uh, uh, allergenic? Well, I can say, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm allergic. I'm allergic to things. You say, well, suck it up. Your life sucks if you're allergic to things. I'm allergic to practically all apples that uh, I can buy. The only type of apples that I'm not allergic to, I can buy at Sage Farms on Chardon Road here, and it's deer apples or horse apples, like the cheapest, the, the, the crappiest ones. They're actually the best. But I buy any fancy apples from the same farm, and they are claimed to be like organic or whatever. I can't eat them. I mean, I have like rash and itchy mouth and stuff. I cannot eat any apples from the store. It's a pain in the butt. So there is no genetic modification involved there, at least in a deliberate one. I'm just damn unlucky, you know, to be allergic to that. Okay, so can genetically modified food be allergenic? Sure, as any other food. As organic food can be too. The, the economic component of this, you know, like people say, oh, Monsanto is evil, you know, because they produce so many. That's a different story. They are evil, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot of money things involved. From the perspective of the, 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 the c consumer, people who buy this food, there's nothing wrong with it. Does that make sense? There are no studies that show that like, genetically modified salmon that survives in the colder waters is any bad for humanity. And to be honest, you know, with population growing, that's our only choice. Seriously. Because we won't be able to produce enough food for the entire humanity if we go out there in the, you know, with a shovel and um, fertilize it with with cow feces or whatever compost. Okay, so it, it's inevitable. Well, the other option is to reduce the population, which is great, but a lot of people take it with a grain of salt. Um, absorption. I will test you on the mechanisms of absorption. I promise. Am I clear? Good. We're going to be talking about absorption of three. So, I will tell you a few words about uh, nucleotides. I'm not going to ask you about those, the absorption mechanisms. Amino acids, carbohydrates, and lipids. Let's talk about amino acids first. We consume proteins. Proteins consist of amino acids. Everybody agrees with this. In which part of alimentary tract proteins are digested first? Or you said it to me. Stomach. Which enzyme does it? Pepsin. Hydrochloric acid is necessary. It's 
Hydrochloric acid is the catalyst, but pepsin is powerful catalyst. So we have a large, say, 100 nucleotide protein. What do you think happens to it in the stomach? It's broken in pieces. Are those pieces individual amino acids or not? Most likely not. Do I make sense? So it's chopped into smaller pieces, but we're not getting to individual amino acids yet. Now, these smaller pieces, this we can call them oligopeptides or peptides, okay, fragments of a protein, end up in the duodenum. What chops those um, protein fragments in the even smaller pieces? You can go back. Trypsin, chemotrypsin, and elastase. That makes sense? They chop them smaller. So what do we end up with? We probably have some individual amino acids now. Or we may have, you know, like two, three nuclei, the two, three amino acid long fragments. And these small chunks end up in the brush border. And in the brush border, we have two enzymes, dipeptidase and aminopeptidase. They break down those small chunks into individual amino acids. Do you understand the sequence here? We got it? Any questions about, you know, how we got to the moment when we have amino acids in the brush border, essentially right at the membrane of epithelial cells? We got it? Now they need to be absorbed. Where would they go? In which biological fluid? Come on. Where do they end up? In which biological fluid? Uh, after they, they, they have to go through epithelial cells. Which fluid? How, blood. How, they, how else they can be delivered, right? That makes sense. But you're absolutely right. They have to cross the epithelial barrier. The concentration of amino acids in the intestinal lumen is huge. We eat them. Does that make sense? Okay, but the concentration of amino acids in the cell is even higher because what are they used for in the cell? Protein synthesis. You have a lot of amino acids in the cell. Proteins are being synthesized. Proteins are being digest, you know, degraded all the time. There are a lot of amino acids in the cell. The problem is when you get amino acids from the intestine to the epithelial cells, you have to pump them. It's an active transport. There is iron that you also have to absorb from the intestinal lumen, and the sign is sodium. Okay? Sodium in the intestine is much higher than inside of the cell. That makes sense. So sodium here will diffuse into the cell, and that secondary active transport, and that sodium diffusion will provide energy for the secondary active transport of amino acids. Does that make sense? We good? Now, if sodium constantly keeps coming into the cell, what's going to happen to intracellular concentration of sodium eventually? It's going to rise. But in real life, it doesn't. So something keeps it from rising. What does? Speak up. Sodium-potassium pump. Sodium-potassium pump that is located 
on the basal side of the cell. So you have sodium potassium pump right here. Okay, that's that's that. Okay. It constantly pumps sodium out. Well, potassium in. Does that make sense? So all that sodium that is absorbed from the intestine is immediately pumped into the blood. Does that make sense? That keeps sodium low, so sodium can keep coming. And as sodium keeps coming, that diffusion provides energy for the secondary active transport of amino acids. Now, amino acids, there are a lot of them in the cell. So here, they can simply diffuse. Well, they can diffuse using facilitated diffusion into the blood. Does that make sense? Okay, so if we want to, you know, draw it, so it's, this is your sodium going down at the apical side, so that's, that's the sodium. This is your amino acid that is pumped into the cell. So this all happened in the epithelial cell apical surface. And then amino acid diffuses at the basal surface. Does that make sense? I'm reminding you, this is the apical surface of the cell, the one that faces the lumen. And this is the basal surface. We're clear. Questions? Questions? No, okay. So sodium potassium pump maintains low sodium concentration in the cell, which allows sodium to diffuse and take amino acid with it. This is called sim porter. So they go together, sim porter. Okay. And then amino acids via you need spelling? Sim porter. S Y M porter. Okay. And then amino acids diffuse from the epithelial cell in the blood by facilitating diffusion. We're good. Can we move on? <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> Can we move on? Carbohydrates. When you eat carbohydrates, what do you eat? It's getting like more and more fun because we get to talk a little bit about nutrition. What do you eat? Hmm? Brad, so what's which carbohydrate is in it? Oh, you 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 do know. Starch. Starch. Starch foods. Okay. So that's where you get carbohydrates from. I mean you can get it from sugar. In case of sugar, a big chunk of work that your digestive system does has been done for you, right? So what is the first part of alimentary canal where starches are digested? Huh? Mouth, yeah, yeah, salivary amylase. Then they go to Stomach, but nothing really happens to them yet. And then they end up in the duodenum. They have amylase, right? In the lumen. In the lumen. So what essentially happens, you have a starch, molecule of starch. And then both salivary and duodenal amylase, pancreatic amylase, they break down starch into the small, smaller pieces, okay? What is called oligosaccharides, disaccharides, like maltose and, and, and sucrose will just come from the sugar, uh, uh, lactose will come from the milk. Does that make sense? And then those smaller chunks end up in the brush border. What is in the brush border? 
dextrinase, lactase, maltase, and sucrase. Four enzymes that will break down dextrins, maltose and maltriose, and sucrose and lactose that are not shown on this picture. And what are they going to break it down to? If it's starch, starch is going to be broken down into individual molecules of GWR. Glucose, yeah, glucose. If it's sugar, like cane sugar, sucrose, what are the two saccharides that make it up? Still G word, glucose, and fructose. And if it's milk sugar, lactose, then it's going to be broken down to glucose and galactose. Okay. Does that make sense? So basically, what you, if you don't eat something funky, then you're going to end up like you eat... When I was a kid, it was awesome. Like you have a bread, you have a little bit of butter on it, and you put some sugar on it, and then a cup of milk. Of course, you had to know where the sugar is. But say if we eat something like that so bread will provide if eventually starch which will broken down into the maltose milk will provide lactose and sugar cane sugar or beet sugar will give you sucrose so end up with three when they all broken down to very individual monosaccharides you end up with glucose galactose and fructose does that make sense? Again, the concentration of these three chemicals inside the cell is much higher. So you need a secondary active transport. Okay. Fructose, the only one that can be taken in by the facilitated diffusion. The only one. Galactose and glucose have to be actively transported by secondary active transport. What drives the secondary active transport? Sodium. Why it goes into the cell? Because there's sodium potassium pump at the basal membrane that maintains low concentration of sodium in the cell that allows that secondary active transport. And then, then all those three different Carbohydrates will use facilitated diffusion to end up in the blood. How does it compare to amino acids? Basically, it's the same. Basically the same. So both amino acids and glucose, let's stick to glucose for our intents and purposes, they are absorbed by the secondary active transport on the apical side and by the facilitated diffusion at the base electrical cell. You got it? Good? Any questions? Fats. This is a little bit more um, complicated. Fats, where are they digested? Mouth, lingual lipase, hmm? stomach, gastric lipase, and intestines. Now, here in intestines, so in intestines, there's, there's an interesting thing. Look at this. So, I've got lipase, lipase and phospholipase. In the lumen, these two enzymes, lipase and phospholipase, come from pancreas, right? So what essentially you end up with in the lumen of intestine? You end up with free fatty acids and monoglycerides. Okay? It's really hard to rip that last um, 
fatty acid apart. It's not necessary at this point. That makes sense. The most, the, the, the vast majority of lipid digestion happens in the duodenum. And I'm going to explain why. <laughs> when you eat fat, what is the fundamental difference? So, okay, fat, is it water soluble or not? It isn't. It isn't. Did you ever try to dissolve oil in water? You didn't? No, I mean, just, just, for, just for kicks. Say, if you take uh, a little bit of oil, like olive oil or still fat, and put it in the water, what is it going to look like? Like a blob. If you shake it, blobs will split. If you shake it really, really, really vigorously for an extended period of time, what's going to happen? Emulsion. You're going to have an emulsion. Essentially, um, it's all very theoretical. Uh, milk, real milk. By real, I mean unprocessed milk that you can get on the farm. Or if you breastfeed and you have extra milk and you store it in the fridge, what's going to happen to that natural milk? Huh? To what? It's not really sediment, it's just lighter fraction in the bottom, and what's on top? Huh? What? Cream. It's cream. It's really cream. I don't know if it's half and half or whipping cream grade, but it's cream. Because milk is an emulsion. Okay? And actually, you can like, you can, if you have an access to a farm with more than one cow, you can separately collect milk from each cow individually, put them in the vessels, and let them separate for the same period of time, and you will see which cow produces the fattest milk, you know, with, with the thickest layer. But it will happen. And if you shake it, it's not separated anymore, okay? So it's an emulsion. When you eat fat, fat exists in, in the kim in the form of globules or droplets. Does that make sense? I understand what I'm saying. Now, enzymes break down this fat. Okay? Now, honestly, it's it's kind of simple question, but you have to understand the chemistry of the situation. The breakdown of fat in terms of this globule, where does it happen? Does it happen through the entirety of the globule or not? Where are chemical reactions? Geographically, huh? The surface. Do you understand that? It's on the surface. Okay? So only fat that's on the surface can be digested. So you can imagine that in this globule, the majority of fat is not on the surface. Does that make sense? Bile salts in the duodenum will solubilize fat, which means they will form, remember we talked about micelles, bile salts will break the large globule into many, many, many small ones. We got it? So now, what happens to the amount of fat that is exposed to the enzymes? It increases, right? It increases. Correct? So, the function of my cells is to solubilize fat to make more fat molecules accessible to the digestive enzymes. Now, lipases and phospholipases, they will start to break them down, okay? The interesting thing is that your micelles in the intestine, they're going to end up containing fatty acids and monoglycerides. Am I clear about it? 
fatty acids and monoglycerides. Now, my cells are covered with bile salts, and they're essentially fat. So they are, they amphiphilic, they fat soluble. Can they be absorbed directly across the membrane? Can they go through the membrane? Well, bile salts will stay outside. They will have to, okay? But the fat will actually diffuse directly through the membrane, and it will end up in the epithelial cells. What do you think is going to happen to this thing in the epithelial cells? It'll get recombined. So in the epithelial cells, this monoglyceride and fatty acids will recombine back to form triglyceride. When you when you bacon, when you put ba ba when you fry bacon. And you, you're done frying, you know, you put the pan to the side, it cools down. What happens to the fat? Solidifies. This fat is triglyceride. Does that make sense? You have a bottle of olive oil. This is triglyceride. They're different, you know, we'll talk about why some are liquid, why some are solid, but it's triglyceride. So what essentially what happens in the intestine? You have a molecule of triglyceride, you disassemble it, shove it into the intestine, intestinal epithelium, assemble it back. Okay? The little problem. Fluids, biological fluids, they're based not on oil, <laughs> they're based on water. Is that a good idea to transport fat in the water? By itself. No. No. Epithelial cells form so called chylomicrons. Those little tiny yellow things here shown. These are chylomicrons. What happens is triglycerides are attached to the proteins. Do I make sense? Proteins are water soluble. Correct? So you have large particles, chylomicrons, that consist of proteins and triglycerides. Now chylomicrons can enter the blood the, the the circulation will get to the point. Okay? And can be eventually delivered to the liver. Does that make sense? Here's the deal. Fats do not get straight into the blood. They get into the lymph first. Lacteal. That green vessel in the center of the villus. This is where the chylomicrons end up. Does that make sense? Now, interesting thing is, if you eat really fatty milk, the amount of triglycerides in the blood, essentially amount of chylomicrons, rises really fast. And if you eat really fatty meal, then the plasma will be really, really cloudy. And you can see how it becomes more cloudy as the concentration of triglycerides in the blood rises. That makes sense. Um, Ever heard about syphilis? Um, now it's so when, when people get tested for syphilis, now it's pretty simple analysis. I think it's PCR uh, or ELISA, some some pretty pretty simple and fast and uh, quick analysis. But ages ago, analysis included the addition of certain chemical to the plasma of a patient. So you collect blood, you spin it down, you separate plasma, you mix plasma with a chemical and that produces a certain reaction, so-called Wasserman reaction. Now here's the thing. Um, if you had some fatty meal right before the blood draw, 
presence of chylomicrons would produce exactly the same reaction. So that's why when you get tested for syphilis, and generally, you know, you know how they say don't eat anything fast. We'll talk about fasting and why it's important pretty much for glucose measurements. But it was convenient also to test people for syphilis. And um, I was brought up in a slightly different environment. I haven't heard about the patient consent until we came to United States. When, you know, I get tested, my blood gets tested in the clinic back home at the time. Nobody asked my consent, can we test you for syphilis? No, it was sort of by default, you know. People were identified pretty quickly. But a colleague of mine told me the story when she was in a uh, medical college. They did Wasserman reaction as a practical. And everybody was testing their own blood, just for kicks. So people were presumed to be negative. And one girl comes out, like, screaming positive, you know, flaming positive. She freaks out, everybody freaks out. Then she realizes, oh, crap. I just had a, like, a, a you know, this eclair with a, with a cream in it. It's 30 minutes before she came to the lab. It's like, it's pretty much pure fat, so it was good. Questions about the absorption? Straightforward? Now, this, I'm not going to painfully go through every aspect of absorption and everything. That gives you the summary, okay? Like, carbohydrates. I want to summarize what I expect you to know for each nutrient. For carbs, proteins, and lipids, which part of the alimentary tracts they are digested in? Lipids everywhere. Proteins in the stomach and the duodenum. Carbs in the mouth and the duodenum. Enzymes that break them down. I told you before what I expect to know about enzymes. Substrate product, the activation pathways for things like trypsin, chemotrypsin, elastins. Am I clear? Also, you know, where they are. You have to remember that, like, I screwed up on the question number four on the, on the quiz. I had something else going on through my head, so I switched from pepsin to, to trypsin. Okay? But, like, pepsin is in the stomach, trypsin is in the duodenum. Am I clear about it? Um, absorption mechanisms. Got it? So, for amino acids and carbohydrates, it's secondary active transport on the apical side and, um, oh, shit, what's the word? Facilitated diffusion in the basal side. Okay, for fats, it's going to be the Absorption via uh, chylomicrons and micelles from the duodenum enter the epithelial cells. Chylomicrons are formed. Chylomicrons enter lymph. Remember, like teal here, it carries lymph. So that lymph will end up in the blood, and only then, you know, it's kind of convoluted route. So I'm going to test you left and right, up and down on amino acids, carbohydrates, and lipids. It's not going to be something out of this world, but for what I told you, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions about it. Am I clear? Nucleic acids, all you need to know about them is enzymes that break them down. I don't really care where RNA, I think RNA is just even before it enters the mouth and just falls apart. It's really unstable. Okay. Enzymes, yes. I can ask you, what's the function of, um, I don't know, phosphatase? Removes phosphate from the nucleus at this level of complexity. Clear? Let's take a break. Um, and when we come back, we'll review the quiz. Then we'll try to get through the most boring part of alimentary tract.